How's it going? So I'm just going to kind of get straight into this. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about tissue culture and what it is, how you go about it, and just kind of explain how I got into this whole industry. It's kind of interesting. So to begin, um, tissue culture started about a, hundred, a little over 100 years ago. and it has revolutionized industries, the bamboo industry, the banana industry, the pineapple industry. Back in the day, you could only take a cutting and get it to root and propagate via that method. And this um, in vitro culture or growing in non-biological conditions or not normal biological conditions, you can actually create an environment where the plant wants to replicate without the need to take all that time um, of creating a new meristem from each plant. So what are the uses of tissue culture in cannabis? This is where, this is a question everybody asks me. And apart from the things on this list, um, I just want to kind of touch on what it actually does. Um, you can actually get about 20% faster growth or reset the genetics to almost seed rates by putting plant through tissue culture. Um, that's not every cultivar and a lot of it is protocol dependent, so I can't talk for every industry or every um, cultivar of cannabis, but specific ones I have seen um, the growth rates exponentially increase by just basically resetting those cuts that are cuts and cuts that have been going on for about 19, 20 years, um, which is huge for this industry. So why do we use tissue culture over cuttings or traditional cloning methods, those sort of things? Um, I guess the biggest one is tissue culture doesn't require maintenance once it's in the tube. You let it sit there and it grows. Um, that means you don't have to water it, you don't have to look at it every day, it just sits there. Um, I've had these cultures stay alive for up to nine months at a time without having to touch them whatsoever under just normal room temperature conditions. And a lot of them will die off by that point, but at the same time, it's good to know that you can keep them in tubes. Um, it's what the USDA actually uses to hold on to endangered species or other um, plantlets that they're having a hard time propagating. I actually started doing quite a bit of this at the Denver Botanic Gardens where I ran their protocol creation lab and I realized while I was doing that, my passion um, lie with cannabis, and nobody in the industry really knew what it was or was talking about it. So that's when I started my company, Minibus, and I've just been going around doing tissue culture consulting and small scale lab setup. And I can't stress enough small scale lab setup. Um, one of the questions I commonly get asked doing consulting is, what's this media made out of? And really it's just all the uh, nutrients, vitamins, and hormones the plant needs in order to grow. Uh, sometimes you can incorporate antibiotics to prevent pathogens from um, either establishing or coming out into the media, or you can add dyes to try and color code some of your stuff. Um, it's all about growing with an input of sugar instead of letting the plant photosynthesize, the plant grows off the sugar that's located in the media, along with all the nutrients, vitamins, and hormones it would normally need to grow. So how do you know what chemical concentrations of all these things to add? Well, apart from lots of different nutrient companies that have developed this stuff, um, there is a media called MS Media. It is the standard for every tissue culture protocol pretty much, that I've seen. Um, there's a couple modifications for bananas or orchids or things like that. But in general, this MS media was um, developed for tobacco culture. And that is key to talk about here because cannabis is not tobacco. So when you put it in this media, sometimes these uh, plants are lacking nitrogen or you're lacking other hormones that you'd expect, and they're just not there. And that requires each individual cultivar to have a specific protocol made for it. Um, I can't stress that enough because in every other aspect of the horticulture industry, you'll see uh, Scutellaria bicolensis and Scutellaria orientalis, or different species such as, that require different hormone and nutrient blends. But most people, when we talk about cannabis tissue culture, they want to do a one shoe fits all to it and hope that it works out with just one protocol. And I've seen that too many times where that's not the case. You'll develop a protocol, it works with one species, not another. Um, so you need to understand the morphology of your plant, I guess, is where the main concept of all this comes in. A lot of people define it as sativa indica and 
I realized um, quite a while ago those terms were invented in the 1700s, the late 1700s, but all the same. So I've grown plants that have a more indica-leaning leaf structure and a more sativa-leaning leaf structure that have the same basic effect and require completely different nutrients. And when I say effect, I'm talking about the hobby. Um, the other thing that I did was I tried a couple different hormone blends that were unconventional, and as you can see in some of these pictures here, they'll produce elongated leaves or just weird genetic issues that are all um, environmental based. So it's epigenetic stress changes rather than actual gene um, changes themselves. Once you culture that plant again and again, it will revert back to the state that it normally was at. There are four common stages to tissue culture, and I'm just going to summarize these because they're in all the literature, essentially. Um, you have your stage one initiation. It takes about two to four weeks, or two weeks for almost every one of these stages. Your stage two, which is your multiplication, you're trying to mass your cells. Stage three, you get the plant to root once the stems have grown and your cells have massed. And then stage four, your acclimation stage, where you go and you harden it off. Um, that rooting stage I need to talk about really quickly, and I'll get into this as well. It's very hard to establish a set rooting protocol for every single cultivar of cannabis. Um, I've read some literature talking about hops and people trying to do indirect cell organogenesis, where it only works some of the time on some cultivars, but not all. And so you run into a lot of problems going down that path. Um, I have found that if you germinate seeds, or quote unquote, a well-designed protocol, so straight MS media, it takes about eight days to root and shoot at the same time. Uh, that can exponentially cut down on your propagation time, but if you do it for cuttings, you have to develop that individual protocol for that individual species of plant, and that is something most people just don't have. So, right now, um, I want to get into stage one, that initiation stage, because this is where the magic um, basically happens, why everybody wants to advertise tissue culture to you. And it's all about just cleaning the exterior tissue of your plant. I'm not talking about endophyte removing or anything else. All I'm talking about is taking something like tween 20, which is a non-ionic detergent, and adding it with some bleach to some reverse osmosis water, so there's no minerals in there, mixing it up for about 10 minutes, and then um, transferring everything under your laminar flow hood in order to maintain a sterile environment. That's about it, but the key there is maintaining clean tissue from the start. So you got to talk about two different forms of stage one tissue culture, at least in cannabis. There's actually a third that's called callus culture. I'm not even going to go into that because as far as I'm aware, very few if anybody has developed a protocol where you can get shoots or indirect organogenesis, so shoots to form from callus culture. We're going to go on to meristem culture, which is taking a meristem. You can see, uh, let's see here, highlighted in that um, red bubble here you can see a meristem. There's lateral meristems and apical meristems. If you take an apical meristem, that tissue can be so new, you can actually culture out of viruses. Yes, you can culture out of viruses. That does not guarantee the virus is going to be eliminated because there's a good chance you had human error and you did not culture out of that virus. So that being said, you need to really look at does your plant have virus in the first place? If it doesn't, I would recommend auxiliary node culture. It's a hell of a lot easier to do. So with auxiliary node culture, all you do is you take a cutting where those uh, red lines are, and you can just stick it straight in your media after cleaning the exterior tissue. Generally, this works out. So that second picture in there, you can actually see shoots starting to form out of the plant, and that's actually two plants out of one. That took about a week, to get to that stage, another week of growth, and it would have been good enough to cut off of, making it so you can exponentially multiply your cuttings. At this point in time, you can see um, the infected uh, pathogen, or the plant that was infected by a pathogen in there, and those pathogens uh, can create huge issues. I've heard quite a few presenters here talk about endophytes, and that's exactly what the majority of them are. You have endophytes or bacteria living inside your cell wall that pop out into your media about two weeks after you've cultured. That's a huge problem. Um, you don't know they're there, and I've heard too many growers tell me, well, my plants are completely clean and I know exactly what's in them. You go to culture their, their crop and it's just 
you'd be amazed what you see out of there. I actually have some pictures coming up of some of those things. So the stage two is the multiplication stage. I was typically getting a one to three to one to eight division ratio per culture every single time I did this. And that culture media only cost a couple cents a piece, so it's virtually free to do once you set up the lab. Now, you only want to keep a plant in stage two, um, or I guess in culture, for no more than five generations at a time. If you do more than that, you start to get genetic degradation the same way that holding onto a 20-year-old cutting would have. So just not a good idea. Stage two, the multiplication stage, has quite a few advantages over just typical cuttings as well. You can create bushy, clumpy plants. That picture in the center I actually managed to get 22 cuttings off of that single 25 millimeter culture. That was huge because all of a sudden I could exponenti exponentially um, manipulate that plant and get a ton of cuttings out of the single uh, plant mass. This also poses another question. What else does it do? It cuts down on your actual vegetative growth time. So when you already have the structure you're looking for, where you don't have to do that initial peach tree pruning, um, where you get that nice bushy top canopy that's all evenly consistent, and you start off with a plant that already has that structure, you can grow your plants a little bit shorter, but they're still going to yield the same amount as if you topped them and topped them and topped them to try and get that yield that you were looking for by growing them out an extra month. The third stage here is the rooting stage, and this is one of the big stages that I'm going to touch on here in a little bit as well, but it just depends on your hormone blend, um, the temperature fluctuations of your culture, and some of the contamination that might happen with some of these uh, cultures. Sometimes you'll have weird contaminants or endophytes that don't want to come out in the media, and once you start rooting, you'll actually see some of the roots degrade because they have endophytes that only like living in the root system. I mean, it makes sense. Plants are like icebergs. They have more mass on the bottom a good majority of the time. So one of the keys I want to stress here is stage three has the potential to ship plants in the dark. Um, I did a small scale trial on this where I did no more than 24 plants and I rooted them in the dark. That first picture is how I got the idea. I had cut a plant down, this is cannabis, and I had stuck it in a 55 gallon trash bag and forgotten about it for a little over a week. Um, week later I just wanted to check, see if it had started molding or whatnot, open it up and there were roots all over the um, lower part of the plant, right where the callus or the undifferentiated cells really would have appeared. You can start to see those white little dots. Those are all root starts. And so I gave it a shot in tissue culture. Why not try it in vitro if it works ex vitro? And the results I got were varied. Um, every plant rooted, yes, but if you look at that picture, the top of the plant didn't always look completely healthy. And that could be due to a lot of different things. Chances are it wasn't developing some sort of hormone and you need to develop a protocol for that particular cultivar that would fix that issue. In my case, I was just seeing binary A or B. Do they root or not? And turns out they do, which was huge for a lot of the uh, future potential in this industry. Now, I also want to advertise uh, the roots are not going all straight down. Some go completely straight out. And I don't know what causes that. I didn't look enough into it. Just thrown that out as food for thought, not necessarily perfect root systems. Stage four, the acclimation stage. This is one that a lot of people are struggling with, so I'll touch base on it really quick and get back into it later. Stage four, you're just getting plants into the greenhouse. That's about it. So once they're there, they develop a nice healthy root system, and as long as you don't add more inoculants and create uh, issues within the plant itself, they tend to remain fairly healthy. Now, at times, um, if you look at the bottom right picture here, you'll actually see some of the plant tissue is deformed or the morphology of it was not correct. That means my initial hormone blend when I was culturing that plant was not what it should have actually been. You'll see different serration issues and things like that. And within about two weeks of pulling it out of the tube, it'll revert back to its normal state. You won't even know it was there. But it is good to mention that those type of things can happen coming out of in vitro culture. 
Um, the hardening stage is fairly simple, but I've seen a lot of people struggle with it, and it's just a matter of removing the humidity over the course of a week. So what you see here is just a soup food container, nothing insane, um, where I just shoved a Grodin Rockwell cube uh, with a plant inside of it, and slowly over the course of about a week, I let it harden off and it worked great. Now, I should mention, um, as I was pulling some of these plants out of culture, the roots would snap off if I accidentally touched them or I brushed them against something. So they are extremely fragile at this state. They've been growing in basically a jello substance the entire time. At that point, you know, you can pull it out, you can wiggle it around, they might not break off, but you go flicking those or tapping them, there's a good chance the plants are not accustomed to that. They haven't developed the, um, re or the resistance in the uh, structure to really be able to move around that much. They were never agitated in the beginning. There was no wind in the tube. Don't expect there to be wind the second you take them out. Um, so the four main problems with tissue culture, and this is the biggest uh, stress I have here, is improper hormone creations. Uh, endophytes, the rooting stage, and the acclimation stage. So the endophyte, or I'm um, sorry, the improper hormones. Every time I have looked and read a research article online about cannabis tissue culture, I see TDZ as the main ingredient. So we got to talk about TDZ here. It's actually an herbicide that is a plant growth regulator, and it causes the uh, leaves to lose weight, but not fall off. So. As you can see in some of these pictures, this was the, uh, some of the first tissue culture I had done, just trialing some of these protocols. The leaves are on there, they're a lot smaller, they're yellowing, and they don't look healthy. I do not recommend using TDZ as a starting point or any other point for cannabis tissue culture. That's just a huge no-no in my book, and I've never found one plant species that works with that cannabis-wise. Um, so using better oxen-cytokinin combinations is a much better idea. Um, metatoplin is the one I would recommend people start with. If you use metatoplin, you get a pretty good growth, but it doesn't always uh, root or it can have other issues. It's just a good starting point. I also included a lot of other cytokinins in this slide, so if anybody wants to experiment, try some of those out, your chance of success will go up. You also need to know that auxins in coordination or in ratio with those cytokinins make a huge difference. Endophytes are the second point here. Endophytes, I drew a nice little pretty picture, uh, live inside the cell walls as indicated by the blue lines and you'll actually see them pop out in the media about two weeks after you culture the plant. Um, this is so problematic I can't even explain how many times I've heard people fail at tissue culture and stop their lab because they literally don't know what happened. So here's the problem. Endophytes can be toxic or novel, um, so beneficial. Those inoculants that we've all talked about adding to our plants that are very beneficial might not culture all so well. That's just a consideration. It doesn't mean don't use them or anything like that. Just be aware of what you're actually adding to your plant and if it's likely to pop out in media if you're trying to get somebody to tissue culture your plant or you're tissue culturing yourself. So here's a couple more pathogen pictures because I just couldn't believe I had over 20 and I tried to fit as many as I could in just a single slide to show you they're all over the spectrum and rather than going through and trying to identify all these, I decided it would be a wiser use of my time to figure out how to get rid of them. So what I did was I noticed we were using inoculants that had endophytic properties, um, such as the bacillus. What I ended up doing was, to get rid of them, I watered with hydrogen peroxide at about a 3 to 5% concentration every day while adding in my nutrients to my water. Over the course of about three weeks, I actually was able to recover some of these plants to the point where the pathogen slowed down, or the endophytes slowed down inside the plant tissue itself, and you were able to get a couple clean um, in vitro cultures. And that was huge. Maybe not all of them, but some of them would take. So if you look at um, common stage three rooting problems, one of the biggest ones I ran into at first was I was using uh, T5 lights, those small little uh, bulbs essentially, and it, my temperature fluctuations would change more than 10 degrees, sometimes up to 20 degrees between day and nighttime temperatures. 
I realized very quickly that was one of the biggest limiting factors and switched to complete LED lights for my uh, tissue culture. It almost overnight fixed my problem, all of them, which I couldn't believe just the temperature fluctuation alone. Potentially some of the light uh, created some of that. And so what I try to tell people uh, when they're trying to create some of these hormone blends or whatnot is look at the compounds or the bottles that you've used as rooting hormones for the rest of your cannabis grow. I mean, people have been doing this for years. Why not pay attention to the IBA concentrations on the back of Clonex or Hortus or Hormex? If you start looking at those and you actually utilize those ratios and some of the additives they're putting in, you're going to be a lot more successful at rooting your culture in vitro. I do also need to mention the previous media plays a big impact or has a big role in your actual next successive stage. If you have too much cytokinin buildup from stage two or multiple application media, your stage three media will have residual and you're going to form more callus than you will roots. Ask me why, don't really know, but that was just a um, something that I saw, along with nonpolar oxins. So I've seen a lot of people that decided I'm going to try and make callus culture and do indirect organogenesis for my first generation. They make their plant, they put it through callus, and they might get a little more, too much callus on there. Um, at that point, they used a nonpolar oxen. If you look at that top right picture, you're going to see the plant is growing upside down. The roots are at the top and the shoots are at the bottom. That's one of those things that most people are not aware of, and so they don't really think about, well, I need to use polar oxens when I'm trying to root things. Um, the last one that I really have noticed is stage four problems or acclimation problems, where the grower will actually pull their plant out of the test tube and just expect, well, it has shoots and it has roots, why can't I treat it like a cutting? Well, these things have been under 100% humidity. There's no reason that you should expect to treat that like a cutting. You have to harden it off like a cutting, treat it like a non-rooted cutting maybe, but not one that you can just plop out of a tube and stick it straight in a greenhouse. I get um, the question a lot, how long does this take? Generally, the acclimation stage is that two week period, sometimes it can go as high as three, but once you start to kind of see the root roots grow, you know the plant's um, a lot more hardened off and generally you can plant it at that point. Germplasm conservation is one of those things that a lot of people have a lot of interest in in this industry and there's a lot of factors that go along with this. You can put a plant in test tubes, stick it in a refrigerator and it slows down the degradation of your media, in which case your plant can live a little bit longer. So. When you start refrigerating your plants, there are a couple basic rules I've kind of learned from literature and other things that you need to pay attention to. Do not go lower than 40 degrees on your plant tissue. You're essentially starting to freeze it and you'll get a lot more cell death. Um, and I should also mention that your contamination, although slowed down, can still be there in a refrigerator. I've stored um, test tubes for a long period of time in a refrigerated condition and over, when I pop them out three or four months later, I can have a world of contamination if I didn't keep that refrigerator sterile in some way or another. I didn't keep the room it was in sterile. So it's very good to know you need to do this in a pretty clean, um, I'd recommend ISO 5 standard lab or better. The other one that a lot of people ask is, can you freeze these cultures, cryopreserve them, that sort of stuff. I have actually never personally tried cryopreserving um, cannabis tissue culture, but what I have found in all the literature is there's all sorts of issues with either freezing or thawing that causes the vacuoles to burst, and that causes a lot more problems in the long term for even trying this out. So whenever I'm starting somebody out in a lab or whatnot, I just recommend they go uh, room temperature, no more than refrigerator, and just work with that, develop their protocols before they try and do long-term storage or commercial propagation or anything like that. Because in the end, you're just going to be dumping a ton of money into these labs without actually knowing how to keep the plant alive in them and why waste your money. Plant breeding was another aspect of um, cannabis tissue culture that a lot of people have had interest in. So I'll kind of touch briefly on it, and that's you can germinate plants in vitro, um, so inside the test tube. It takes about eight days for them to get uh, to about the point of the middle picture. And you can screen them for pathogens. So medicinal genomics, I know, has um, a female-male indicator for sex testing. And what I found was if I grew them in a test tube, I could 
pop open the lid, take a little bit of tissue sample, run it through PCR and extract the DNA, and be able to see is it male or female, um, since it does not detect hermaphrodites, it was a you know somewhat biased test, but at the same time, male or female for those uh, for the sex of that seedling. That allowed you to separate the seedlings out in your room, and you could then grow all female or produce a much higher quality breeding program. The other one is green pod sowing, where you can actually uh, pollinate a female plant and wait a week until the seed starts to develop. The embryo develops first, and then the seed coat develops around the embryo. When you pull the seed early and the embryo is developed, you can actually put that in culture and grow it out, and you can cut months off your breeding cycles every generation, because you're not waiting for a seed coat to develop. With all the nutrients, hormones, and vitamins, the plant needs in order to grow and keep it alive within the seed coat itself. So. The big one that I'm going to talk about is a cost-benefit analysis of tissue culture. And I have a couple different labs that I've set up, and I try and do, you know, all the way from small scale to medium scale. I try to avoid the large-scale propagation currently, because I don't know anybody that has a completed protocol that can get any strain you want or any cultivar you want through the entire process from start to finish without a hitch. And when people are asking about times, how long can I get a return on my investment, those sort of deals, when you start to get these numbers and throw them out there, you don't want to give a false impression of what you're actually providing. So what I would recommend is go with the essentially thirty-five dollars to $40,000 lab if you really want to start and figure out what protocols uh, you need to make or how to go about making them. You can always go a little bit cheaper if you need to, but that $40,000 range allows you to get a good hood, a good autoclave, and really um, put your plants through culture efficiently and successfully while having the ability to trial some other medias and some other hormones just to make sure you're not basically shooting yourself in the foot. That being said, if you go more expensive labs, you are still able to do in-house breeding techniques, you're still able to do production and all that. And if you start at the low scale, your equipment does not become senile or obsolete over time. You can still use the old hood and the old autoclave as you're expanding to a bigger lab to get the results that you're really looking for. So with that being said, I have a couple more minutes here, and I'm just curious on if anybody has questions, I'd love to take some. Uh, you mentioned the endopathogens you're seeing in the system that contaminate the tissue culture. Are those plant pathogens uh, that will eventually be reflected in the plant, or are those just a problem in the tissue culture? So those are a um, pathogen that you will see eventually reflected in the plant, and sometimes they are beneficial and sometimes they are toxic. Mm -hmm. So. If they're present, it makes your tissue culture process much more complicated and much harder. Initially, they're in the plant when you took the culture, when you took the explant. So when it was before in vitro, before stage one, you have the plant to grow, and that pathogen is present. By cutting it out and putting it in a tube, you're just showing that it's there rather than eliminating it um, altogether. There are methods of eliminating using antibiotics or other things, but those are all protocols that still have to be developed for cannabis specifically. Okay, one quick follow-up to that. Uh, I'm sure not in your tissue culture operations, but in general in the industry, are there certain pathogens that are appearing in, uh, in product put out by the current nursery practices? Um, I don't. I can't speak for tissue culture being put out per se, but I do know um, there are quite a few present. Uh, Fusarium is one among them. I've actually cultured that out myself and looked for that. Uh, I've also heard confirmation of other growers finding Fusarium in their plants. Uh, different species of Bacillus. Um, I think Phytophthora is a pretty big one as well. And those are all the know all that I know off the top of my head. But I'm sure there's a plethora of them. Thank you. Well, can you comment on the addition of beneficial symbionts at any of the stage, mycorrhizae, um, fungi, that kind of, uh, those kind of uh, uh, 
microbial additions? Yeah, sure. Um, so every time that I have gone to, I, I should mention, I've worked in a bacteria culture lab. And when I did that, we had to make specific media and antibiotics to make it so other bacteria didn't grow in there. When you're making tissue culture media, there's no antibiotics. You're basically creating a cocktail that everything loves to grow in, including fungus and bacteria. So you're perpetuating the problem if you add those inoculants right before you uh, take the culture itself. So is there an optimal stage, like at your rooting stage or whatever, that you can add it before you, you actually go ahead and root in matrix and soil? You cannot. You have to add them in your soil itself um, because under in vitro conditions, that media will grow whatever you're trying to add and take over the plant. So it is not really a tissue culture solution. It's a matrix. It's a post-rooting uh, post in the matrix solution, as you're saying. Right? Yeah, exactly. Hey, fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. Um, how are you determining whether the viruses are, are there or not? Um, is this just a visual detection? And then uh, with respect to the slide that you had, with uh, which I love, the uh, you had your, your cost-benefit analysis there. Uh, is the automated step, um, I, I assume that uh, liquid handling or sample prep is a big part of, of that protocol. Um, uh, can you speak to any uh, software that you've seen or, or um, systems that are being used in a high throughput way to uh, do some of that method development and protocol work? Um, actually, yes, I have. So uh, I found it on a YouTube video, actually, that's uh, pretty readily available if anybody wants to look for it, of a couple very large scale production labs that have automated media pouring techniques that they do. And so it'll pre-make the media in the autoclave and then pipe it as a, a flat moves along a, basically um, a line. And that flat fills every single tube and all of a sudden you don't have anybody filling tubes. You have people picking them up, setting them on the rack and pulling them off the rack pre-filled. Um, and then would you repeat your other question please? Yeah, so you mentioned that um, uh, you're, you found disease, um, I'm sorry, viruses. When you've identified these viruses, I'm wondering, is this visual detection or are you actually doing some kind of uh, uh, more, more validated? Uh, <laughs> so there's a couple different techniques you can actually use. The first one would be visual identification. But there are strips that you can actually use to tell are there viruses in those plants? And they have a 99.8% accuracy. Um, I've trialed some of those and confirmed there was no virus in the first place. So it could just be you thought that it looked like that. Sometimes, because those strips are so specific, you actually need to take it to a commercial virus testing laboratory and have them run an analysis to see is there a virus in there. And they can only test four things that they're that they think might be in there. Um, a lot of those virus testing laboratories, um, again, I used to work for something like that, uh, are not able to figure out random viruses or things that they don't know what to look for. So I guess the short answer to that is, yes, you can visually try and detect and identify, and sometimes that'll work, but I always recommend getting a third-party lab to really make sure that your culture is, in fact, virus-free, and if you're gonna try and do it in-house, at least use a strip test. They cost a couple bucks a piece. Mm. Make sure you don't have a virus in your plant tissue before you go selling it. Well, I, I, there's obviously controversy over whether some viruses are systemic yep. and whether you can get rid of them, so, you know, I, I think it, it can be a touchy issue as when you're saying that uh, tissue culture can completely remediate uh, a, a virus because similar to the problem of um, the variability within you know these chemovars that you're, uh, you're you're culturing you're going to see probably some some phenotypical uh, differences there as well yeah I, I would completely agree with that actually and even when you go to take your meristem culture at times if you take too much tissue you still haven't cultured out of the virus so it's very important to know using um, either strip tests or third-party labs that you did in fact culture out of that and not just relying on your eyes to you know tell you yeah well thanks so much yep